Dear friends, welcome to the service for Good Friday, taken from the Book of Common Prayer. You may follow with me on page 276, page 276 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pause in silence and center ourselves on God. Blessed be our God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations, Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? But he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. The 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. 
Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They steer and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. And those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Be 
the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the temple police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised them that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am. Am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You're not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. They replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? 
Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What? Is truth. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he is claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but they cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to them, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. If you are seated, I encourage you to stand at this time. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them in four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, and the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. 
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the people did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. These things occurred so the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices and linen cloths, according to the burial customs. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord our God in whose name we pray, amen. I have served the church most of my adult life and been a priest of the church for almost 15 years. As I shared in a recent sermon, I have been surprised over these years by how little prepared some people have been to face their own mortality. And yet I and the churches I have served have known seasons of great loss with many funerals to plan but it is nothing like what the human race is facing at this time. In a culture that has pushed back against death, even denying it, we cannot any longer. This is the reality common to us all. Our mortality faces us. When my dad died 11 years ago now, as I've walked with others through their own grief, I was caught off guard by how overwhelming it was. That loss was all I could see, feel, or touch for days and weeks and months. I wanted to ask why of God, why I was too overwhelmed by it all. Our culture is grieving like this at this moment. And for we, the healthy, I think we are so consumed with avoiding this plague, we are caught so off guard that I'm not sure I feel the permission to ask of God why all this is happening. As followers of Jesus, the church has been one of the few places in the culture that talks about death. We always have, for good reason. One death in particular has changed us. Today, this Good Friday, we contemplate anew the agony, the betrayal and denial, the corrupt trial, the scourging, torture, death, and burial of Jesus of Nazareth. And we had the permission to ask why. Why did my Jesus and your Jesus, my Lord and your Lord, have to die in this way? 
The cross makes people uncomfortable in our culture. It can be shameful for some, a stumbling block for others, and foolishness for the rest. Despotic regimes even tear the crosses off of churches. It's not something talked about in polite company, even in polite churches. As one of America's great theologians, Richard Niebuhr, wrote all the way back in 1937, many churches of his day preached a God without wrath who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. But the cross casts an inescapable shadow. We know that Easter Sunday is coming, but we can't escape the cross on our way to the resurrection. So on this Good Friday, in this year of the pandemic, we ask again, why the cross? Now, I'm aware of several explanations offered by theologians, but I see the cross as a magnificent, multifaceted jewel. No one theology of the cross can capture the whole. In my own life, there are three facets that have drawn me to the cross. I'd like to explore each one with you today. First, on the cross, Jesus identified with suffering and all those who suffer in our world. Jesus was an innocent man. Pilate said so at least four times. Herod said so too, as did a Roman centurion. Even one of the criminals crucified next to him said so, guiltless and righteous without fault. Throughout human history, the innocent oppressed of our world have cried out, who cares that we suffer? Who hears us when we cry? Where is God? Christ Jesus, scripture says, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Where is God? There, high up on the cross. In Jesus' death, God identified with the suffering poor. He suffered and died as countless others have in human history. Jesus was the suffering servant of God, described in the passage of Isaiah that was just read. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Sister Mina Lalita Barwa, a Catholic nun, was horribly sexually assaulted nearly 10 years ago during some of the worst anti-Christian violence in India's history. She has said that Good Friday reminds her Jesus gives value to all the suffering of humanity. I suffer because of my faith, because I am religious. I suffer for Jesus, my master, whom I love, and he loves me, and this gives meaning to my suffering because he suffered too, she said. He suffered humiliation, and he understands my humiliation. He suffered rejection. He accepts when I am rejected. He suffered shame, and he honors me. He suffers physical and mental pain, and he heals my physical and mental wounds, she said. He died on the cross and forgives my sins. That is why the cross, but more. On the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of this world. When he was arrested, Jesus tells the powers, the political, religious, military, and criminal powers, this is your time the time when darkness rules. Here the forces of wickedness that crucified Jesus are named. And their names are not Pilate or Herod or Caiaphas or the Jews or the Romans. No, their names are the rulers of darkness, the powers and principalities under satanic influence. This is what killed him, death and the power of death. These are the rulers of darkness that deny people's humanity 
They're being made in the image of God. The culture of death and of violence. The hatred of racism, of prejudice, and of oppression. And the worship of all false gods. He took all of that, all of the powers, and as Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, he canceled them when he was nailed to the cross. He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, Paul said. He shamed them publicly by his triumph, his victory over them on the cross. The cross was not Jesus' defeat at the hands of the powers of this world, but his victory over them. And this has been the message in every age of every martyr that has faced down the powers of this world from ancient saints like Polycarp and Perpetua to Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Simon Weil. Those empowered by the cross of Christ confidently confront the powers too. Jonathan Daniels was an Episcopal seminary student. He answered Martin Luther King's call for clergy to join the Selma to Montgomery March for voting rights. After the march, Daniels felt that he couldn't stay away. Something happened to me in Selma, he said, which meant I had to come back. I could not stand by in benevolent dispassion any longer. Daniels moved in with a local family in Lowndes County, Alabama, and joined voter registration efforts and attempts to integrate churches. In August 1965, Daniels was jailed with a group of protesters for a week. After the release, a few of them stopped by a store to buy some Cokes. As Ruby Sales, a 16-year-old African-American woman, approached the store, a deputy sheriff appeared with a shotgun and cursed her. Daniels pulled her to one side. Ruby Sales recalled, next thing I knew, someone had pulled me from behind and I heard a shotgun blast and, and I looked and I saw John falling. He was killed by a single blast from the shotgun and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Jonathan Daniels called his work living theology. I think it was when I got tear gas leading a march that I began to change, he said. I saw that the men who came at me were themselves not free. I began to discover a new freedom in the cross, freedom to love the enemy, and in that freedom to will and to try to set him free. That is why the cross, but more. 400 years before Jesus came low into our world, God revealed his heart for the human race through the prophets. That the Messiah of God would come to restore us, redeem us by reconciling us to God because of sin, because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Sin must be dealt with. It is a rebellion against the beauty, justice, and glory of God. Overwhelmed by the sin of the people and of his own sin, the prophet Habakkuk poured his heart out to God, saying, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. In his mercy, God allows us to go, to go our own way, and we do in our own self-will, and in our pride we go and get ourselves lost, really lost, so lost that we can't make our way back home again. We've built a wall of separation between us and our God, God by our sin, sins known and sins unknown, things done and left undone by not loving God with our whole heart or our neighbors as ourselves. We decree judgment upon ourselves. We are rebels at heart, rebelling against the God of love, justice, and mercy. We are too lost to return to God by ourselves. Someone must deal with our rebellion, someone who has not rebelled themselves. Someone else must take the judgment we've decreed on ourselves. Whoever could care enough or even love us enough to do such a thing. God so loved the world, Jesus said, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What wondrous love is this, the hymn writer asks, that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. 
I don't understand. It is beyond human capacity, but I know he did. Two things can be true at the same time. In the words of the hymn writer John Newton, I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. This is also why the cross, on it Jesus took our place. It was two years ago during Holy Week that the story of Lieutenant Colonel Arnaud Beltran of the French Gendarme made the news. He was on the scene at a supermarket where a terrorist had killed two people and was holding hostages. The Lieutenant Colonel offered to take the place of the female hostage and the terrorist agreed. He drew close, Beltram did, leaving his cell phone on so the poli police could hear. When they stormed the store, Beltram was stabbed and shot and died the next day. The National Post newspaper reported that he died the day before Holy Week began and that his widow insisted that the sacrifice could not be understood apart from his Christian faith, which had been nourished by the monks at a nearby abbey. In an editorial, they wrote these words. And what of the woman whose life was spared when Beltram took her place? When her Friday morning began, she did not think that she would need to be saved that day. She was going to buy groceries, but she found herself held hostage by a terrorist, and she needed a savior. Did she imagine that deliverance would come from a member of the gendarme? That she would not go to an early grave because he was willing to do so instead? What did the terrorist say to her? Perhaps words like this, you may go, he has come. He went on to, to say, you can see why Beltram's wife, mourning her husband, was thinking about Holy Week. Is that not what happened then long ago in Jerusalem? That is what Christians mark on Good Friday. A terrible estrangement between God and man has been wrought by sin, and the wages of sin is death, as St. Paul teaches. Can that estrangement be overcome? Christian theology considers the human race to be held hostage, as it were, in mortal peril because the reality of death cannot be overcome then comes the one who can overcome. And the hostages are free, not freed by overwhelming power, but because there was one to take their place. On Good Friday, Christians look to the cross and hear just that. You may go. He has come. Because on the cross, Jesus identified with the suffering defeated the powers, and died for sin. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Amen. I invite you to join me for the solemn collects on page 277. Page 277 of the Book of Common Prayer. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Brian, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of, our, of our, your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. 
for Donald, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and God with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which are cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him to whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls. Now and in the hour of our death, Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, 
and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen.